It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Thursday, July 25th, your daily dose of Flyers news analysis and high quality content that's all in on Mitch Koff madness, mania, whatever we're calling it. I'm here. Actually, I think that it was pretty normal, like subdued almost. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You could find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here, as always, with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. We are at Locked On Flyers on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and Twitter as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. You can find us over on YouTube or on the SiriusXM app or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, we are going to get right into that Matt Vay mitchkoff press conference. Just a quick programming note first off. Um, I know our nemesis of the week uh, earlier this week was surprise and anything could happen. Uh, but uh, we are going to take our August off-season time. So we'll have our show today. And then we'll be back next week for our three-day-a-week schedule, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But of course, should anything surprise us and come up, we'll hop on and do additional programming as We're necessary. all pretty sure it's going to be quiet for at least a month. But, well, you know. Yeah, at least a month. Uh, but of course, then we'll be back uh, full-time in September when uh, rookie camp gets going and so on and so forth. But in the meantime, uh, we did have a press conference yesterday to welcome Matt Vay Mitchkoff to town. A busy couple of days for Matt Vay Mitchkoff. Uh, day one, you know, even after uh, yesterday's show, he spent some time at the gym. They showed him uh, getting introduced to some of the players, uh, definitely had a workout because uh, he couldn't get on the ice. And it was really nice like that they uh, let the team that was practicing continue to practice and not make way just for him to get on the ice. Uh, but Mitch Cuff yeah, well, did that's smart business, honestly, because yeah. they have paid to be yeah. there. And, if, you know, no, I, I, I appreciated what they did. Yeah, absolutely. And so he did get on the ice on Wednesday, though. So seemed like that helped him like feel a little grounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they just want to take ice. a few, you know, take a few spins, take a few shots, whatever, have some fun. Um, I guess that the last hockey he played was sort of like the beauty league, but honestly, he does need to take like a month off the ice and work in the gym and do those other things, get used to the town. And I think they're going to have him do that for the most part. So that part's good. Yeah. And so in this press conference, they had uh, Slava Kuznetsov, who is a skating coach in the Flyers organization, and uh, he helped translate for Matt Vemichkov. It was uh, over 21 minutes, this press conference, which was a lot longer than your typical uh, player introduction. I know there's extra time for the translations, but it's still pretty significant. No, it's pretty significant. I mean, everybody had a lot of questions. We really hadn't spoken to him since the draft. So, yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we had talked about on yesterday's show about questions we had was in terms of family support. And they did say that his mom and brother were going to come in like a month to six weeks or so. Yeah. His his mom's Maria and his brother Prohor, if I'm pronouncing it correct, which I may not be. Uh, yeah. But like Danny said, Plans could change. It could get delayed. Like, you know, they have to set up everything visa wise or passport wise and everything. So they got to find a place to live. You know, it's like it's going to take a little bit. Yeah. But it's good to know that they're at least uh, keeping that in mind and, yes. and have plans to, to give it's them smart. Some it's smart. family support. I think obviously the biggest question that everybody had up front was how did he get here now and what was the process like? And they remained pretty cagey about the whole thing. You have to. I mean, because, look, we know what's within the rules and what's not within the rules. And everybody's like, well, you you know, we're pointing to Montreal and they're like, well, look, you can't do that. It's not with the CBA. I get it. I understand what's with the CBA, what isn't. I also know what happened in the past. 
um, with players. And so it's like, I can't tell you what's going on. None of us can, but that's why we just listen to what they say, whatever they tell us, we write down and that's it. Yeah. And of course, I think plausible de deniability is the watchword here for Mitch Koff himself. Uh, you know, where he said, it didn't concern me in any way. My representatives right. and representatives of SKA and the Flyers were involved. They agreed upon it themselves. I didn't participate in any way. I just continued to train and prepare right. for everything, no matter what was happening. Uh, so, but now he's very happy. And thank you to Flyers management and the fans who were waiting for me. I'm very glad to be here now. And that's exactly what he had to say. Yeah. I mean, he was well coached. And he said the right things. He did. Uh, on the Briere side of things, you know, he has reiterated that they never expected to get him this early. And I think he's truthful in that. Like when they drafted him, they couldn't have expected that. So that no. is truthful. I think there is a point, though, where he had an idea that he was probably coming and still was playing this up. But that's OK. That's what a GM has to do. Yeah, you know, he said he thinks that Mitch Koff would have gone much sooner in the draft had there not been a three-year delay. He would have. Delay. I don't know if he'd have gone second, though. I think that's a little... Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but maybe fourth or fifth, Yeah, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think the Flyers were very lucky to get him in that draft. Oh, and no I question. think it was, as we said at the time, and we, we have said since, it was the right move to make to take that pick and... Now we're going to see uh, how they make it come to fruition here. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that I appreciated about Danny Breer is, A, he's extremely uh, well prepared for these sorts of things, and he knows exactly what he's going to say uh, in terms of all of that, in terms of they never expected it. You know, he's repeated that time and time again. But also, like, you could sort of see the human side of it and talked about right. his own language barrier and using hockey terms as the bridge to learning English and that, you know, getting jokes was a huge thing that that's like, once you really get the jokes, that's when, you know, you have a good feel of the language. Yeah. I think there's something to it. I mean, back in the day, I had some players say they used to watch general hospital and they learned English that way when they <laughs> that's came a over. Good no, way. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is before teams, Hire tutors. They would just watch soap operas. So there is something to it. A uh, little sunny Corinthos action. <laughs> yeah. I, it was before. You're that. like, this I is, don't know who that is. <laughs> I know. This is way before that. This is even before. Jimmy Alan Friend. Quartermain. <laughs> yeah. Even before Alan Quartermain. Um, but uh, anyhow, because it's been on a long time. But <laughs> it's before Luke and Laura, all that. But the point is, uh, I think he has the right idea. I think the only missing component from this whole thing was uh, communication with John. Now, John doesn't really run practice, except for once in a while he'll do stuff. So I don't think it's going to be a big deal for that. But there is going to be a thing in games and such. And so I think they are going to have to figure out a system for that. Because I'd be surprised if game one of the season, and we know how the season's going to start with the kind of tip, kind of competition they're going to have, that all that's going to be 100% straightened out. So it's going to have to there's going to have to be a, a methodology of some sort. Sure. Um, you know, Breyer mentioned that he was excited to have Mitchkoff work under Tortorella. And I mm -hmm. think he was sort of hinting that, um, you know, he's really going to have to develop his defensive game oh, yeah. you know, under he the didn't Tortorella. Hint at it. He, he said it. He said he it. Said it. <laughs> yeah. He said it directly. Uh, he also said that sometimes with Tor's words aren't necessary, which I thought was kind of hilarious. Well, sure, if you stare the kid down, he's going to understand he did yeah. something wrong, and and yeah. he would do that. I mean, look, we have to be realistic about this. We heard that there were defensive failings over in Russia. I watched a lot of video. I could see where there was that, and then we could see that you know he has the NHL upside for skill. So there is a learning curve that's going to happen here, and you have to just kind of like not rush him into being the best guy on the team or thinking he's the best guy on the team. Cause he's not when he's coming in right now, he might be the fifth or sixth best guy on the team. And then you kind of see where he's at. That's really where that's. And I think that's how they're going to treat it. Cause that's how John generally does it. So from that perspective, that part will be good. Yeah. 
I think so too. Well, there's a lot more to talk about here on questions about how does he feel potentially being the team's savior? What's his process to adjust? And um, how does he feel about the fans and, and all of that? We're going to get to that uh, coming up next. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. And now we're in full swing for summer sports like baseball. We absolutely miss hockey, but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. FanDuel has odds for Major League Baseball, the Paris games, over-unders on, over on metal counts by country, soccer, and so much more. Be careful with the soccer. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. On Monday show, we'll have a new summer poll question for you. We're going to get to the results of this week's poll uh, later in today's show. Plus, we'll have our nemesis of the week and so much more. So stay tuned for that. Uh, more about Matt Bay Mitchkoff and his arrival. I think that, you know, in terms of what he thinks he has to do to get ready um, and, you know, what did he learn in Sochi? I thought it was good to know that the Flyers uh, were keeping in touch with him while he yeah. was at Sochi. That was, uh, I, I don't know that we'd heard that really solidly directly before. No, not to the point of like, hearing that there were text messages and such. So no, and, and things to work on even when he's there. So that part's good. That's, that's, that's really good. You know, I think another big key here is because he, he's felt this pressure uh, ever since he was a young player that he has to be the guy, the flyers have to tell him the minute he walks in, you don't have to be the guy. You don't. Yeah. You'll turn into yourself as a player over time, but you don't have to feel like you have to win every game by yourself. That's not how this league works. And I think they should explain that to him. Yeah. And I feel like he at least gets part of that now. And, and Danny Breer's part of it. So he said specifically, we don't see him as a savior. He's 19. He's coming in to learn and to expand his game right now. They hope the sky is the limit with him. And that was an exact phrase that Breer yeah. used. But he's one of many pieces to build this team. And I think that's part of, honestly, the upside to John Tortorella, that he is one of he's a piece on the on the team. He doesn't right. have to be everything in John's system. Right. No, that's true. The other thing I want to parse out, though, is and of course, the Flyers didn't use this. And to be fair, I have not heard the fans use the word savior. So a lot no. of us sort of cringed when that word came up in because that's sort of like old fashioned thinking from like 15, 20 years ago. Like you get this guy and all of a sudden he's going to lead your team to the Stanley cup or that were the case, Connor Bedard's Chicago Blackhawks would have made the playoffs. And you know, it just doesn't happen most times no. now. Cause so that's something where I feel like that the flyers handled that one really well, because you know, nobody's saying that I don't hear fans saying that honestly. Yeah, but he does understand that there's high expectations for him and his role, but not that he has to save everything. And, you know, and he, he said fairly, you know, he wants to do his absolute best. And he used the word maximum, you know, maximum right. effort from his side. Um, and, you know, what the fans give me, I want to give in return is right. essentially what he said. And that's all you can ask from him. Yeah, no. And that's in all that's good. And I don't think anybody's going to tamp down that enthusiasm, but he's also going to have to understand that, you know, most of his game is the fun offensive part. He's going to find some unfun things about hockey now that he's going to yeah. have to attack with that same enthusiasm. Right. So that's going to be part of the learning curve because in the case, right. you know, when the coach tries to tell you that and it's not working out, what they, what do they do? They just transfer you to another team. Well, he's not getting transferred to another team now. So, you know, now that part's going to have to get worked on. Exactly. And, you know, he, he said that he was going to keep his personal goals to himself, smart. which was super smart to do. He's like, I have them. 
but they're they're for me right now and nobody mm-hmm. else. And the task at hand is to get the Flyers to the playoffs and get them to climb as high as they can in the in the standings and in, in the playoffs moving on. But so his outward focus is going to be on the team and he has his personal goals to align with that. Yeah, no, that's that's good. I mean, I thought that, that was a very mature answer. Uh, and I appreciated that answer from him. I did because I've seen guys, you know, break into the league. And like we talked about in other shows, when it's generally like, you know, some really talented Russians, they're usually not this age, even to use a further example. So when Tarasenko broke in and I covered Tarasenko in the world juniors, he, he demolished his shoulder in a game against Canada and still played two thirds of that game and scored at least one or two goals to help his help Russia win. Right. Everybody remembers that. Well, when he came over, he was still 21. And even that first year, he only played 38 games, had 19 points. The second year he came over and he had 43 points, 21 goals, 22 assists. And Tarasenko was ridiculously skilled and ridiculously talented. So the same thing could happen here. And then by the third year, he had 73 points. And you might see a similar curve here. And that's okay. Yep. Sounds good to me, honestly. (laughs) Uh, One of the other moments that I thought was really wonderful was, you know, he was asked about how, you know, his father would have felt with this moment. And like, I honestly almost teared up a little bit because I I can't imagine like that aspect of it. It's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. And he basically was like, I don't know how I feel right now. It's been this two days of whirlwind. Um, It's like a dream. Um, but that, you know, he feels like that state will pass with time and he feels confident and that his father would be proud and he of wants course. to win a cup and all the cups that are possible in his honor. And I, I just like, oh, my heart just melted. Yeah, it, it was it was a nice um, best answer he could give. I thought he did really well with that. Yeah. And then the other part, which I thought was uh, really good um i ran some of what he said through google translate uh just to get to see if there was some additional color there to what he said Mm -hmm. versus just what slava was was passing along and slava did a great job don't get me wrong yeah he's not Uh, he's not a professional translator so he he got overwhelmed at one point Right. And so, and I know Google translate isn't perfect, but there was a particular uh, part of uh, when he was asked about being in communication with other flyers, team members, um, you know, they had brought up Eric Johnson um, that they had texted back and forth. And, you know, he talked to the Russian guys on the team, but that he mentioned that Sean Couturier had written him and was very warm and, and Mitch Koff said, you know, they greeted me. I'm very glad. And I want to respond to everybody with the same warmth that they showed me. And I want to get close to them. You know, he said specifically that he wants to be able to build those relationships and that, you know, that relates to this team and this locker room so much in terms of being a very close knit team that's very supportive. And he just wants to be a part of that. And I just thought that was really cool to hear as well. Yeah, no, no question. That that was good to hear. Um, but some a little bit of reality when when Danny said that when um, he told him about Nick Delorier being his best friend, this is going to be your right. best friend. You know, if I'm Bobby Brink, my heart just dropped because <laughs> that, that's the last spot in the lineup. Like it really is. Well, and if yes Brink, and no. Well, I mean, on an everyday basis, it, it kind of is. And so Maybe. If, if Brink doesn't really kill it at a camp, he's going to lose playing time to Nick Delorier for policing whatever might happen with Mitchkov. Like this is a, a thing now where it's, you know, the, the spots are getting tighter on this team. Like it's going to be harder to make this team than last year for younger players. I think, you know, we're all seeing that it was, we all talked about it after let's put it that way. It raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Well, especially, you know, ironically on yesterday's show, we talked about the fighting and Nick Delorier and what the exact impact of that was. And we do understand that there's, there's fights that are strictly for defending the honor of somebody who got Mm -hmm. wrecked or something like that. And sometimes that's why the fight takes place and it's not just for a momentum change, but 
I think, you know, one of the things we said was that there's other ways to accomplish that, whether it's right. through hits and physical play or scoring a goal on your own, right? Or right. having an offensive push and zone time on your own as the statement. So, you know, it kind of goes both ways here. Um, but yeah, that is something to keep an eye on in terms of the roster spot for sure. Yep. It's, it's a like, you know, Danny brought it up for a reason. He did. Um, I think, you know, the other uh tidbits you know fan related uh they somebody asked him about the phillies hat that he wore you know we talked about that with his airport arrival we talked about it at length and um i think you know again one of the things that slava maybe didn't um get across which wasn't the main point of what mitchkoff had to say but that you know he understands the phillies are a good team uh the baseball hat was a group decision (laughs) that was made Um, But the little extra tidbit that Slava didn't mention was that he's really interested in meeting the Phillies and the team there because he's interested in how people are and how they operate in a different sport and what he can learn from that. Um, But he's going to root for the Phillies, of course, as it is. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'll tell you, this takes me back to the draft when Neil Yakupov was taking batting practice before he was drafted first overall. Um, in Pittsburgh and he had no idea how to hold a bat. He had no idea of anything. So they may do the same thing with Mitchkoff, like just get in there, kid. Let's see what you got. I hope they yeah. don't, but if he has fun with it, fine. But you know, yeah. at least give him some tutoring. Cause I, Yakupov was just chucked in there, man. Yeah. And I think, you know, my favorite quote uh, from the entire press conference was anyone can play in the NHL, but only a few can win. And he gets that. And yes. that that was a big moment, I thought, as well. Yeah, I think to know that at that age, to be that aware, yes, that's that's a hell of a thing to know. Yeah. Anything else to add uh, as you were in the room? No, I actually, like I said, I don't think it was overly done. I don't think it was too over the top at all. I think they had just the right tone to it, which was good. I think, you know, it, it went just right to kind of just introduce the guy to town. Hey, you haven't seen him for a while. Yeah, we know he, you know, he could be the best player in a few years, but it's, you know, it's going to be a few years. And I think, I think everything was right. I think the only thing missing was John Tortorella. Yeah, I, I think that is fair. All right. Uh, we are going to switch gears and talk about those poll results on your favorite flyers uh, coming into town after being established on other teams. We're going to do that coming up next. So the exact wording of this week's poll was, which is your favorite NHL player to come to the Flyers after establishing an identity with another team or teams? And our five options to you were Chris Pronger, Yaramir Yager, Danny Briere, Jeremy Roenick, and Eric Desjardins. And uh, I think that the results did not go the way I thought they were going to go in terms of the top vote getter, who was Chris Pronger with 32% of the vote. What do you think about that? I knew it was going to go that way because he got to the Stanley Cup. So that's fair. That's that fair. was the reason. That was the tell for me. But, you know, I figured that the way the rest of it went, I was a little surprised that. Ronick went ahead of Yager as well, like the Yager was. So that part surprised me. Yeah, I think so. Because um, Danny Breer came in second with 27%. So no not surprise. too far behind Prager. And that's who I thought was going to take it, mostly because of the length of tenure that Breer played in Philadelphia versus Pronger. And the fact that Breer had established this Mr. Playoffs identity with the yeah. Flyers. He had it. He had like a role in an identity with the Flyers that was separate from what he had done in Buffalo and with Montreal. So I just felt like that locked him down a little bit more. But I get why you'd pick Chris Pronger. I mean, you know, legend did get them to the cup in a lot of ways. They brought him in for that purpose. So it makes it makes sense logically. I just thought emotionally, maybe Danny yeah. Rear would get would get the edge there. But yeah, I think you're right. I think Yager. I, maybe because he was here for such a short time. Maybe, that maybe that was why, the reason. 
I mean, yeah. Desjardins, you know, I get why he outpaced Yager because he was so super yeah. popular. Like, I get that. Oh, my God. Well, he was kind of a lone wolf in his time with the Flyers of being like the only good great right. player on the team right. for at least three years, I would say. Yeah. Right. Yep. So uh, I think that was a huge part of why Desjardins outpaced Ronick and Yager combined. So. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a tough choice here. They're all great options, to be honest. Oh. So uh, I think that that part of it was interesting. There were some comments about this, and William sent us an email um, saying uh, in terms of the, when we talked about Flyers going the other way in that episode, uh, we didn't mention Chris Terrian to Dallas Stars, Rich Sutter to the Canucks, and Scott Hartnell to Columbus. and. I don't know. I maybe Rich Sutter to the Canucks had a a strong impact. Yeah, I would say Sutter's that one. Were so loved in Philly. Yeah, I would say that one. I mean, Terrian had his role and he was really good at it, and he shut down mm -hmm. Yager. But at that point, I don't think anybody was surprised Chris Terrian got traded. Uh, yeah. You know, if you want to say Jeff Carter to Columbus, okay. I may have listened to that one more than Scott Hartnell to the Columbus, believe it or not, because Hartnell at that point, I felt like was losing something off his fastball, too. Yeah. Uh, but as far as like the comments directly related to the poll, um, you know, the comment section was very Yager heavy. But oh, yeah. Well, you knew uh, I, that. I mean, he's a yeah, he was very well liked. He's a polarizing kind of guy. He's a legend as well. And so, yeah, of course, Yager left a big imprint here in a short amount of time. Yeah, it, it was like kind of a bummer that it was uh, it was so short. Well, yeah, but, I think um, he wanted to stay for another year. I do. I don't. I don't really know what went wrong with that negotiation. I will tell you one another funny story though about Yager. So, um, there are times when sometimes they would open up the uh, locker room maybe like a second too soon. All the players haven't scattered yet, if you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. Yager was kind of left in the middle there, and I was like the first one in, and I saw that he had a weight pack on him, and I'm like, what's that? And he goes, what do you mean? I'm like, on your back. And I even have video of this. It's pretty funny. And then he went and explained how he uses that in skates. And But, you know, Yaga would rather not talk about his training methods and what kept him in the league. He would rather you just think it's, you know, all talent. But he did a lot of hard work. And, no, and that's what we started to find out. for skating out. around with those weights. Right. But we never saw them. That was the only time we ever saw it. So, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, yeah, of course he was entertaining. And honestly, if he hadn't gone on to a lot of those other teams, the traveling Yagers would not oh, be yeah. as as funny as they are without any of those. They others. were great. I love the traveling Yagers. Yeah, uh, and I think he still did. He still play this past season. He did. I don't know if he's playing anymore, but he did play this past year. I mean, he is still part owner or 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 owner of the team. I don't really remember. Right. But let's see. He um. Yeah, he had four points, four assists in 15 games. So I'm guessing that's his last year at the yeah, age of 52. I, yeah, I just need him to keep playing. So there's somebody older than me who's still playing. Yeah, to me, he's a youngster at 52. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but listen, to be fair, Gordy Howe played until that age, and Gordy Howe did better. Like it just shows how it's hard true. it is to play at that age. But like Gordy Howe, um, in his last year with the Whalers, had 15 goals in 1979. That's not too shabby. It's really not. How old was and, he? Like 55. Uh, let's see. He was. I want to say he was 52 as well. Let's see, 79, 80, and he was born in 28. So if you go 28 to 78, that's that's 50. So I think that is 52. Yeah. I think it's the same age. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Wild. Yeah. Those were crazy times. Um, the Whalers made some crazy things happen. But, yeah. uh, and he had two points in three playoff games for them. Like he still could play. It's crazy. I can't even imagine anybody in this league who's a skater lasting that. Well, long. that's the thing. I mean, back then the skating was slower and we know it. So the physical part of him still was there and the shot was still there. Like I remember yeah. that, you know, vividly. But as far as now, like skating, the only one, Mike Gartner was the only one. He he kept his skating legs until the very end. Like that time that he won the fastest skater at the All-Star game, it might have been at like a, at, at MSG in 2000, something like that. Um, 
we were all like, holy moly, this guy could still skate at this. And he really could. He skated right till the end. He was really fast. All right. That will do it for today's show. We'll be back on Monday with our new nemesis, our new poll and new flyers talk as well. If you have mailbag questions, you can get those in on Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube that's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Have a great weekend, everyone.